Hello everyone, I hope you're doing fine. In today's lesson, which is a listening lesson, we're going to talk about optical illusions. So the first thing we're going to do is have a look at some pictures that show some optical illusions and I would like you to think about um, what the illusion is. Um, what can you see in this picture? What kind of illusion is it? How was it created? What do you think? And let's see the following one. This is quite famous. What can you see there? And what's, how was this created? And this one? All right, so I'll go back. So in this one, we see some kind of animal within an animal right? So you can see, uh, probably, right? I'm, I'm just guessing. You can see a cat, first of all, and then if you look closely enough, you can see a rabbit, a rabbit inside the cat. So it's like a, two animals merged into one. In this one, and when, when I say this, it's not that it's just uh, the only correct answer, it's just what I can see. Um, the first thing I see is an old lady uh, looking downward, right? And I can see that this is her mouth, this is her nose, her eyes, her hair, and something covering uh, her hair somehow. But then, if I look again, I can see a young lady. This is her neck, a necklace, her jawline, this is her nose, some eyelashes over here, this is her ear, this is her hair, and then again something covering the hair. So I don't know if you can see the same thing I see, but that's what I see in this illusion. And this illusion is a drawing. And the third one is an illusion created in some kind of... with a, with a photograph, right? The photograph of a man that was cut in such a way that you can see this in two ways, uh, in my opinion. You can see this uh, from the side, as, it, as if the man was looking to his um, was looking right to the right direction, or it's a picture from the front of the man and has been cut, and so you can see half his face somehow. So these are the illusions that I can see. I hope you could see the same ones. So what you'll need for this lesson is two pages from. Uh, the Unit 6 file on Edmodo. So first of all, we're going to work with the Power Up activity. Then we're going to go to the Listen Up activity, where you have two activities, two, three, four, and five. And then the Speak Up activity, which is meant for you to record, same way we've been doing so far. Then you're going to need this other page, also in the file, where you have further listening activities. You have activity 1, 2, 3, 4, and a timeout activity that is just meant to be a little bit uh, of fun, to see how much you know about these uh, characters. All right? So these are the two things that you will need for this lesson. Now we're going to start with the power-up activity. So the power-up activity says, work in pairs. Look at pictures and discuss the questions. Of course, you cannot do this uh, in pairs, really, but um, the idea is that you think about these answers. So look at this picture. What can you see in the picture? How do you think this illusion was created? Can you describe any videos with illusions or tricks that you have seen? We have seen some before uh, we started this um, with this activity, but I mean others. And I'm going to show you some sample answers to these questions. So as you can see there, someone might say that it's a picture of an empty table and it has been taken on the tablet. 
A coffee cup has been placed on top of the tablet and another photograph has been taken from directly above to make it look like the cup is part of the photograph on the tablet. Hmm? So that's uh, how this illusion was created, let's say. And then as regards the second question, someone might say, one of the best illusions I've seen was a 3D pedestrian crossing. It was just painted on the road. But the way it was done in 3D made it look like there were rectangular blocks on the road. It looked really cool. And more than that, it had a useful function. Apparently, it was great for getting cars to slow down. So that's uh, just someone describing an optical illusion. My challenge for you here is that you try and find the picture of this optical illusion being described here and you post it on Edmodo. Let's see if you can get it. Now let's move on to exercise two. In this exercise, you have to listen to an interview with Javier, an illusionist and filmmaker, and Maria, a journalist. Why do you think Javier has been so successful? So just, you just listen to answer this question. And of course, all of these activities are on the page. So it, th the best thing you can do is just solve them on the page. Now let's just listen. Recently, a three minute video has been circulating online showing a young man doing the impossible. He jumps through closed doors on a moving train. The video has got over 35 million views and was made by the 21-year-old illusionist and filmmaker Javier Perez. He's here with us in the studio today. Welcome to you, Javier, and to Maria Teller, a journalist who has been very critical of this type of video. Hi. OK, well, first of all, Javier, I'm sure everyone wants to know, how do you go about putting together these incredible videos? Because nothing is real, is it? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> it actually needs hundreds of takes before you get the right one. And then, to create the effects, it's about getting the right place in the video footage and doing some careful editing. A lot of people try to overcomplicate things with software. Many people think I use special effects programs, but I don't. For me, that would be cheating. I realized that I could do much better and get more hits by making videos that appear to defy the laws of physics. So, Maria, does that satisfy your past criticisms about photoshopping and so on? <laughs> well, to some extent, yes. In my role as a journalist, I spend a lot of time ensuring I report accurate information to the public, so I do object to these videos which show something which... <laughs> essentially isn't true. I think they alter our judgment and understanding of what's possible and leave us less able to respond to real life events. All right, so let's see, what do you think? I'll leave a sample answer here. Because he's technically very good and creative and spends time on his videos, uh, so dedication is key for his line of work. Now we'll move on to the next exercise. Now I'm going to read the task and identify the key words. Think of different words and phrases to express the key words. So in this type of listening task, the question and the options can be quite long. So if you attempt to read everything at the same time and solve everything at the same time, it can be a bit overwhelming. So the time you're given before you actually listen um, should be used for you to spot those words that will guide your listening. So the idea is that you read each of the questions and you mark or underline the key words, the words that will guide your listening so that you don't have to read everything every time. So I'm going to ask you to pause your video now, uh, underline the keywords that you can find, and then press play again for you to see the sample answers. So these will be the sample answers. For question one, it would be making videos feels and then gratified interviewers' interest, proud a result of something, in this case technical skills, satisfied sophistication, worried and dishonest. Then for the second one it would be thinks videos affected lives, 
challenged profession, changed the way we think and prevented discussion. For three, agree, upset, educational tool, drawing a new audience, way to raise discussion. So if you had similar things to this, this is not just one correct answer. Sometimes the underlining is a bit more personal, but in general terms, you should at least have underlined these words. Maybe you underlined more words than these, but as long as you have these ones, you will be fine. So let's see four. Would be suggests. The success, allow perfect, unusual, wider variety. Uh, for five, view, controlled, damaging, bad way, achieve popularity, different effects, different people. And finally, for six, both think. Always disagree what's best, audience growing, be able to sort illusion from reality, more discussion, problems. So these are the words that will help you guide your listening. So now that you have these, let's actually listen. We're going to skip the exam tip because the idea is that you, you, read, it, you read it on your own if you want to, but it's basically the same thing we've done uh, right now, spotting keywords. Uh, if you want, you can pause the video now, read the exam tip section, and then move on to power up exercise four. That's what we're going to do now. So now you actually have to listen to this again, but now you're going to listen to the full audio and complete the task from exercise three. For questions one to six, Choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. This will be a self-check uh, task um, once we listen to the six questions. I'm going to go over these slides and show you the correct answers. You auto-correct. So let's listen. I hope you're ready. Recently, a three-minute video has been circulating online showing a young man doing the impossible. He jumps through closed doors on a moving train. The video has got over 35 million views and was made by the 21-year-old illusionist and filmmaker Javier Perez. He's here with us in the studio today. Welcome to you, Javier, and to Maria Teller, a journalist who has been very critical of this type of video. Hi. Hi. OK, well, first of all, Javier, I'm sure everyone wants to know, how do you go about putting together these incredible videos? Because nothing is real, is it? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> it actually needs hundreds of takes before you get the right one. And then, to create the effects, it's about getting the right place in the video footage and doing some careful editing. A lot of people try to overcomplicate things with software. Many people think I use special effects programs, but I don't. For me, that would be cheating. I realized that I could do much better and get more hits by making videos that appear to defy the laws of physics. So, Maria, does that satisfy your past criticisms about photoshopping and so on? <laughs> well, to some extent, yes. In my role as a journalist, I spend a lot of time ensuring I report accurate information to the public, so I do object to these videos which show something which essentially isn't true. I think they alter our judgement and understanding of what's possible and leave us less able to respond to real-life issues appropriately. Surely that's going a bit far for what, after all, is a visual joke for entertainment. What do you both think? I don't think so. For instance, I believe that if you see endless videos of someone being run over by a car in the name of entertainment, you become less shocked about real-life accidents. And maybe you assign blame differently. You think it's down to the victim, not the driver going too fast. I suppose what's good is that at least the videos allow us to debate this kind of thing. Uh, can I jump in here? I do think Maria is being unfair. We do all sorts of things in the name of entertainment. And we've always had magicians. It's a very old craft. And surely it's a good thing that we aim to exploit the assumptions we make around the laws of physics in order to test them. 
And it's in a way that can be understood and discussed by the man on the street. But, Javier, you don't create these videos by yourself. Don't you live with a team of illusionists? Yes, I've got a team. We live together in a kind of studio. There's so much interaction that we're always creating something. We start off with brainstorming. That's where we got those ideas, like seeing someone getting pulled along by a car or the video of an egg, apparently with a chick inside. The part I enjoyed most was working out how we were actually going to do it. It just wouldn't work so well if we weren't together all the time. And we are constantly having to reshoot things. And all credit to you. Now, what about freebooting? When people repost your videos without asking, how do you feel about that? Yeah, the videos are often freebooted, where someone takes online media and rehosts it on their website without permission. It's bad practice, but almost impossible to control. Sometimes we'll ask them to credit us, but I don't mind it because it can help us if they then get hundreds of millions of views. But I do understand how hard it is for other people who spend hours creating stuff and then someone just steals it. So do you two think you can ever meet in the middle over your views of these videos? Uh, I guess intellectually we can see each other's argument, but our objectives are so far apart. And I feel I'm on the side of right because more and more people are coming to our site. Having said that... I do think audiences are becoming more sophisticated and more discerning about what they want to believe. Yes, these illusions will forever be a thorn in the side of the press, but I'm sure the discussion about reality will act as a kind of transparency for the truth. And ultimately, people are not silly. Hmm. Well, thank you both. We will watch with interest. All right, so let's go back to... Um, the questions and the answers. If you need to listen to this once more, uh, my piece of advice is that you go back in the video and you listen to this again so that I don't play it again and we have a very, very long video. Uh, if you need to do that, pause the video now, go back and listen again. And then from this moment on now, I'm going to give you the answers. So let's see. For number one, it's B. Proud that the videos are a result of his technical skills. And this is what he says. Many people think I use special effects programs, but I don't. For me, that would be cheating. So that's the key part of the listening. For number two, it have changed the way we think. I think they alter our judgment and understanding of what's possible. That's what Maria says. That gives us the clue for uh, letter C. Three, it's D, are an effective way to raise discussion of certain concepts. I suppose what's good is that at least the videos allow us to debate this kind of thing, and surely it's a good thing that we aim to exploit the assumptions we make around the laws of physics in order to test them. And it's in a way that can be understood and discussed by the man on the street. So those are the clues for one, two and three. Now for number four, it's A. A responsible for the success of his videos. And this is what uh, was said. There's so much interaction that we're always creating something. We start off with brainstorming. That's where we got those ideas like seeing someone getting pulled along by a car, or the video of an egg, apparently, with a chick inside. The part I enjoyed most was working out how we were actually going to do it. It just wouldn't work so well if we weren't together all the time, and we are constantly having to reshoot things. Then, as regards number five, it's B. It can be demanding for some people. But I do understand how hard it is for other people who spend hours creating stuff and then someone just steals it. And six, it's C. People will always be able to sort illusion from reality. I do think audiences are becoming more sophisticated and more discerning about what they want to believe. The discussion about reality will act 
as a kind of transparency for the truth and ultimately people are not silly. So there you've got all the answers. Let's go back. So for 1b, 2c, 3d, 4a, 5b, 6c. All right. So let's move on. Now you've got a kind of vocabulary activity where you have to spot some phrases that were used uh, in the listening. The idea is that you match the two halves and you take a minute to do that and then I'm going to show you the answers. And then the idea is that you search for these words in a dictionary uh, and take down notes as regards uh, the meaning they have or examples of where they have been used and you have to upload that. So complete the expressions with these words. Get, assign, be down, jump and all credit. Now you have to pause the video, take some minutes to solve this and then press play uh, again so I show you the answers. Okay, so the answers are get a hit, assign blame, be down to, jump in and all credit to. So now your job is to try to look for these words and examples of these expressions being used so that the meaning is clear to you. Let's go to the last activity now. It says work in pairs and discuss the questions. You're not going to do this in pairs, but, but what I would like you to do is to think of your answers for these. Please do not write them down beforehand. Just think about them and then record yourselves answering these questions and you send the audios in the assignment in Edmodo. In the era of computer-generated images, can we believe anything is real? And two, is seeing, believing. All right, so these are the last two questions from this part of the lesson. Your job now is to stop the video, record these and get them ready, or you record them at the end, all right? So now we'll continue with the other page of the book uh, th this page is taken from the workbook of the same book and you're going to do another listening activity that is similar to the one that you have done. I say similar because it's the same kind of activity, it's a multiple choice, but of course it's on a different recording. Uh, so we're going to do the same thing we did with the other one, we're going to work on keywords first, then you're going to listen, you're going to choose your answers and we're going to work on the vocabulary. Um, if you want, you can uh, do this another day so that you don't do everything in one sitting. Um, that would be fine. So uh, I'm going to move on now, but if you want to pause and then continue some other time, that's fine. Now you're going to listen to an interview in which illustrator Patrick Hampton and psychologist Melanie Rowles talk about using pictures as therapy for children. For questions 1 to 6, underline the key words. Think of different words and phrases to express the ideas. Uh, something I didn't mention before is that when you do a listening and you underline key words, you need to be prepared, you need to be ready for the people in the audio not to say exactly the same words that you have in the options. So this means that they will use synonyms or paraphrases. That's why thinking of different words and phrases to express the ideas is a, a good exercise. So, let's see the questions. You've got them there and you've got them on the page. Um, I'm going to ask you to pause the video now, go through the questions, read uh, and underline your keywords. And when you're ready, press play and I'm going to show you some sample answers for your keywords. All right? Okay, so let's see what we've got for number one. We've got say about his previous work, paint rather than draw, 
didn't consider drawing for his sister, wasn't enthusiastic children's illustrations, and then preferred illustrate comic books. In this case, almost everything <laughs> is underlined. Let's see number two. The way his idea developed. Proud, successful business, surprised happened so quickly, pleased, help so many people, overwhelmed, purchases. Let's see number three. What should be avoided? Depending on the owl, teach children behave. Telling the owl how they feel, their parents, leaving children alone too long, allowing children to spend talking to the owl. Then we'll see what the owl is. Then for four, Melanie think telling made up stories Negative impact creativity isn't the same lying, can be disappointing, parents do too often. For five, imaginative play, Patrick and Melanie express both. Hmm? Sadness replaced by technology, nostalgia, childhood memories, desire promote schools, frustration taken seriously. And finally, for six, life enjoyable, Replace power, make believe, better, more realistic, other games, ruining and childhoods. So again, you've got your keywords for one, two, and three, four, five, and six. Okay, so now let's move on to the next exercise. There. You have to listen now to the interview and for questions 1 to 6 choose answers A, B, C or D which fits best according to what you hear. In this case I'm going to play this once and what you can do is go back then and listen to it again if you need to. Same as you did with the other audio. So now I'm going to play this. Today I'm talking to a children's illustrator, Patrick Hampton, and a child psychologist, Melanie Rowles. Patrick, you've been selling soft toys of Oscar the Owl to help parents support children with their emotional development. How did you come up with the idea? A few years ago, my little sister had to spend a month in hospital, and even though I spent hours with her every evening, it broke my heart to see her look so afraid and lonely every time we left the hospital at night. So I drew her a picture of an owl and called it Oscar. I told her that owls are night animals, so it would stay awake to look over her. By the time she was discharged, all of the children on the ward had asked for pictures of Oscar the owl next to their beds. For some reason, it really resonated with them. I'd been struggling to get noticed as an illustrator, and it was the most artwork I'd had commissioned. Although I've always drawn doodles for my sister... I'd never thought about children's illustration as a career. It seemed too silly, and I thought of myself as more serious. But I figured that I had nothing to lose, so I developed the character of Oscar the Owl more and invented a short backstory, then started selling different versions of the illustration on a peer-to-peer e-commerce site. How long did it take you to start making regular sales? It actually gained momentum pretty quickly and I was able to set up my own website dedicated to Oscar the Owl. Eventually, I was able to raise enough capital to start producing and selling soft toy versions of Oscar. I realised that I'd tapped into something special when I got a call from a children's author telling me that she'd been inspired to turn the idea into a series of storybooks and asking me to illustrate it. I've also had emails from teachers about ways they've used Oscar in the classroom, I honestly had no idea that it would be used by so many people in so many different ways. But given that the premise is uncomplicated, I suppose it makes sense that people could connect with it and use it as a springboard for development. Melanie, from a psychological point of view, what benefit can something like Oscar the Owl have for children? Actually, Oscar the Owl can be used to exploit some very serious issues, such as bereavement and abandonment. Children often feel more comfortable sharing their feelings with imaginary creatures, and the owl is traditionally seen as a wise, solid creature. 
While I wouldn't recommend allowing children to become too reliant on Oscar the Owl, or indeed any other physical substitute for human contact, being able to open up about things that are troubling or upsetting them can help process difficult feelings. This is especially useful for children who are more withdrawn, or children who may be developing emotionally at a slower rate than normally expected for their age. Children are known for having very active imaginations and believe that Oscar the Owl is real. This can also be exploited by parents as a tool for reinforcing positive behaviour, for example by writing notes from the owl, thanking the child for tidying up their bedroom. Do you think it's dishonest to encourage children to believe that something is true when it isn't? Not necessarily. While some psychologists believe that leading children to believe that certain things exist when they don't can inhibit their imagination, I think that it feeds their imagination. It's possible that children may feel let down to learn that something isn't true, but make-believe isn't about tricking children into believing something. It's about presenting them with a situation and then letting them take it from there. Children actually learn to differentiate between fiction and reality at a much earlier age than many people realise, so they are able to understand that what they imagine isn't necessarily possible in the real world. Finally, how important do you think imaginative play is in the age of technology? Oh, incredibly important. I can't stress just how important it is. Children benefit enormously from games of make-believe as it stimulates the learning process. If you ask me, there's no harm in indulging children's naturally inquisitive natures, especially when real life can be so bleak sometimes, and some children have to deal with tough situations at a young age. I grew up in the countryside having adventures in the woods, fighting battles with sticks and making friends with the people who lived in the river. It makes me uncomfortable to think that a generation might miss out on the simple pleasures of running around on a made-up quest in favour of an electronics-based one. I see the difference in the way that they play and the games that we used to play when we were younger. Children spend so much time on screens nowadays, and while I recognise that there are some fantastic interactive games out there, for me, nothing beats traditional play. Even the most advanced electronic games are limited to the specifications of the software, whereas there are no limits on what a child can create using a cardboard box. All right. So, if you need to listen to this again, of course, you press pause and you go back. Now, I'm going to show you the answers. So, for number one, it's C. It seemed too silly and I thought of myself as more serious. 2. B. I honestly had no idea that it would be used by so many people in so many different ways. 3. D. While I wouldn't recommend allowing children to become too reliant on Oscar the Owl, then she goes on. In 4. It's B. Make-believe isn't about tricking children into believing something. It's about presenting them with a situation and then letting them take it from there. 5B I grew up in the countryside having adventures in the woods, fighting battles with sticks and making friends with the people who lived in the river. That was Melanie. And then Patrick says, I see a difference in the games that we used to play when we were younger. And finally, 6b. It makes me uncomfortable to think that a generation might miss out on the simple pleasures of running around on a made-up quest in favour of an electronics-based one. That's Melanie. And then Patrick says, whereas there are no limits on what a child can create using a cardboard box. So those are all the answers. 1c, 2b, 3d, 4b, 5b, 6b. A lot of b's there. Hmm? Let's move on to exercise 3. You listen again and complete the extracts with the correct words. I'm not going to play this again, so you will have to go back in the video, listen to this, complete, and then 
come to this point to see the answers. I'm going to let you pause now and go back. Here are the answers. It actually gained momentum pretty quickly and I was able to... I realised that I'd tapped into something special when... Given that the premise is uncomplicated, I suppose it makes sense that... And for... This can also be exploited by parents as a tool for reinforcing positive behaviour. 5. Children actually learn to differentiate between... 6. Children benefit enormously from games of make-believe. If you ask me, there's no harm in indulging. And finally, 8. Especially when real life can be so bleak sometimes. So you've got all the answers there. 1. Momentum. 2. Tapped into. 3. Premise. 4. Reinforcing. 5. Differentiate. 6. Enormously. 7. No harm. And 8. Bleak. Let's see exercise 4 now. You have to match the words from exercise 3 with the synonyms from A to H. So we have momentum, tapped into premise, reinforcing, differentiate, enormously, no harm and bleak. And we have supporting, greatly, idea, not a bad thing, make a distinction, discover, driving force and hopeless. So I'm going to give you a minute now for you to complete this task. You have to pause the video and when you're ready you press play again and I'm going to show you the answers. Now that you're ready, let's see the answers. So supporting is number four, reinforcing. Let's see, BE greatly is number six, enormously. Let's see, C, idea. Idea is number three, premise. Now D, not a bad thing, is seven, no harm. E, make a distinction, is number five, differentiate. F. Discover is number two, tapped into. Tapped into is in the past, you should notice that. So it should be discovered, tapped into, or discover, tap into. G, driving force, is number one, momentum. And H, hopeless, is eight, bleak. All right, so I hope that these phrases are clear. In case you have further doubts, please don't hesitate either to ask me or check with a dictionary. But these are very, very cool phrases and synonyms to start using. Hmm? And finally, let's see how much you know about these characters. Which of these famous characters do you know? Match the characters 1 to 8 to the dates these characters were first aired or published. So, Snoopy. Mafalda, Dora the Explorer, Scooby-Doo, Mickey Mouse, Pikachu, Paddington Bear and Hello Kitty. Let me tell you, people, I know all of them, but I have no idea when they became famous or when they were first published or aired. So I'm with you here. I have no idea. So let's play. What do you think about number one, Snoopy? Mm, Snoopy was 1950, mm, quite old. Hmm. And what about Mafalda? Do you know about that one? It was B, 1964. Hmm. Dora the Explorer is a bit younger, I think. Yeah, the year 2000. Scooby-Doo. I don't think Scooby-Doo is as old as Snoopy or Mafalda, but I, have, I don't know. Okay, yeah, 1969. Mickey Mouse? Mickey Mouse is old. Yeah, 1928, that's right. 
Pikachu, a bit closer to this date, I think, yeah, 1997, so a bit older than Dora the Explorer, but younger than most. What about Paddington Bear? 1958, and so we are left with Hello Kitty in 1974. All right, so that would be all. Uh, I hope you could follow the tasks easily. Um, I hope to see you soon again. Bye.